The Apostle Paul writes more books in the New Testament than any other author. His last book is written to a friend named Timothy. He writes it from prison in Rome. He's alone. All of his friends have left him. It's fall. It's getting cold. And he writes, Do your best to come to me quickly. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. It's getting cold, so he's like, Well, bring like the Columbia ski jacket and my scrolls, especially the parchments. He's a writer. Do your best to come before winter. Why before winter? In the Mediterranean in those days, uh, at a certain point in the late fall, the season for navigation would close. It wouldn't open up again until spring. And so he's saying to Timothy, come before winter. I could be put to death by the Romans and you may never see me again. Some things have to be done quickly before winter. There are people living today that will not be with us a year from now. The 181 passengers and eight crew members who boarded Lion Air 610 in Jakarta on October 29th. The 157 passengers and crew members that boarded Ethiopian Flight 302 of from Addis Ababa to Nairobi on March 10th had no idea it would be their last day. There are opportunities within our reach that will not be available to us a year from now. There are innovations and in products that must be launched now or the market will pass us by. There are relationships that need to be restored before winter. Today I want to ask you to pause and consider your life. What situations are you facing that would be in the category of come before winter? You may have never been in church before or you haven't been in church in a long time. You may be a teenager or single or married or an empty nester. What things in your life would be in that category of come before winter? As a pastor, I visit a lot of people who are near death. Their backs are against the wall. And I find they only want to talk to me about two things. Their relationships with their family or close friends and their relationship with God. I've had people tell me, boy, Ron, I'd love to take a mulligan with my son. I'd sure like to have a do-over with my daughter or with my dad. And they ask me, where do I stand with God? What's going to happen to me after I die? One area where we need to come before winter has to do with our relationships with people. If when Timothy received this letter from Paul in Ephesus, what if he had said, you know, I'm way too busy. I've got all these things I have to do, so he lingered. Then when he finally got on the road, he decided to stop and visit some friends in Athens. Then when he came to the dock at Troas, he's told the season for navigation is closed. The next ship out will be April all winter long, Timothy worries, and he takes the first ship in the spring, and he, as soon as he gets uh, off the dock in Rome, he runs and inquires about Paul. And the guard says, haven't you heard? Paul was executed in December. Every time he came, uh, every time someone came to his cell, Every time I came and I stuck the key in the lock, he would say, is that you, Timothy? Then Timothy would have wished he'd come before winter. Winston Churchill was a great statesman. He had one person, though, he had a difficult relationship with. It was Lady Astor. 
One day, Lady Astor said to him, Winston, if I was married to you, I'd put arsenic in your tea. And he just glared right back at her and he said, if I was married to you, I'd drink it. <laughs> Another time they went to a ball and Winston got disgustingly drunk. And at the end, they were trying to exit to the same time, trying to go through this doorway, which is obviously too small for them. Winston's a big man and Lady Astor was a woman of substance. And they went through together and Christ on the floor. And Lady Astor got up angry and she said, Winston, you're drunk. And he looked right back at her and he said, Lady Astor, you're ugly. <laughs> but I'll be sober in the morning. On 9-11, 2001, 3,000 people lost their lives in the Twin Towers and lost their families and friends. It was a sobering moment for our nation. They had memorial service after memorial service in New York City. At one of them, a person wrote this poem for a mate that they'd lost in the Twin Towers. If I knew it would be the last time that I'd see you fall asleep, would tuck you in, I would tuck you in more tightly and pray the Lord your soul to keep. If I knew it would be the last time that I'd see you walk out the door, I would give you a hug and a kiss and call you back for one more. If I knew it would be the last time I'd hear your voice lifted up in praise, I would videotape, videotape each action and word so I could play them back day after day. If I knew it would be the last time I could spare an extra minute to stop and say I love you instead of assuming you would know I do. If I knew it would be the last time I would be there to share your day. Well, I'm sure you'll have so many more so I can just let this one slip away. For surely there's always tomorrow to make up for an oversight. We always get a second chance to make everything just right. There'll always be another day to say I love you. And certainly there's another chance to say anything I can do. But just in case, I might be wrong. And today is all I get. I'd like to say how much I love you. And I hope we never forget. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone, young or old alike. And today may be the last chance you get to hold your loved one tight. So if you're waiting for tomorrow, why not do it today? For if tomorrow never comes, you'll never regret the day that you didn't take that extra time for a smile, a hug, or a kiss and you were too busy to grant someone what turned out to be their one last wish. So hold your loved ones close today and whisper in their ear. Tell them how much you love them and that you'll always hold them dear. Take time to say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you or it's okay. And if tomorrow never comes, you'll have no regrets about today. If a 9-11 taught us anything, it's to save nothing for the next life. To do what must be done. To say what needs to be said. Time tricks us into thinking that we can wait until tomorrow to do what we should have done yesterday. Is there a parent or a sibling or a child or an ex or an in-law or a friend with whom you need to get right? Husband, wife, maybe you've allowed romance to slip out of your marriage and bitterness to creep in. Restore that relationship before it's too late. Another area where we need to come before winter has to do with our relationship with God. I can think of four reasons we need to come before winter. I can think of four reasons there's an urgency with God. One is because of the uncertainty of life. A number of years ago, Jory and I were vacationing with our family in Michigan, and our daughter uh, Cam is a pro tennis player, and she, uh, the day would go typically like this. First thing in the morning, I would drive her to South Bend to a tennis academy, and then in the afternoon, I would pick her up. Well, that day, I asked Jory if she would, uh, wanted to go with me to pick her up, and she said, sure. And so we drove this two-lane highway, cars are going about 60 miles an hour, and, and uh, 
When we got there and picked up Cam, I asked Jory, I said, would you like to drive on the way back? She said, okay. And so Jory was driving, Cam was in the right passenger seat, and I was kind of lounging in the back seat on my elbow. And all of a sudden I heard Jory say, oh, Jesus, save us. And I quick jumped up to see, and this white ram truck had pulled out right in front of us, obviously didn't see us. And Jory just had time to move to the other lane to get around this truck. But in the other lane was coming an 18-wheeler. And just before we were about to hit it, Jory quick got back in our lane. And I thought, oh my goodness, that could have been the end for the three of us. And then I thought of our little Erica, who was 11 at the time. She would have no parents. And our daughter Jamie was 13 at the time. All of our kids would be, would be without parents. You see, we just don't know how long we're going to live. David writes, our days on earth are like a shadow. They can be snuffed out like that. On November 8th, of last year, Derek Bentley, one of the members of our church, parents woke up at 6 a.m. at their home in Paradise, California, when police came through and on uh, bullhorns were shouting, get out. Wind had downed power lines. Fire lit up 70,000 acres and destroyed 7,200 home, 7, homes in 12 hours. All that they had built up over the years was lost in 12 hours. At a previous church, before I came here, uh, we built a building and we took out a loan. A requirement of the loan was that we take out a key man life insurance policy on me uh, to protect the church uh, in the event of, of my unexpected demise. Well, it's nice to feel valuable. But it's a little unnerving when you realize that you may be more valuable dead than alive. <laughs> I mean, I was afraid to even walk in the parking lot if I saw a board member driving. <laughs> I mean, they might decide I may be more valuable to the church if I made the ultimate sacrifice. Paul says, For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We believe Jesus was crucified on the cross, he was raised again, and he's coming back. And we don't know when he's gonna come. He goes on, so then us, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. We're not to be lulled into thinking that we have forever to decide about God. The second reason we need to come before winter to God is because changes in attitude you may have something happen in your life when you say, oh my goodness, there must be a God. I need to get to know him. I need to think about my relationship with God. I need to go to church. But if you don't do anything about that thought, you may lose that sense of urgency. Isaiah writes, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. We have to seek God while he may be found. Now, that doesn't mean that there's a time when God is not available to us. Rather, it means there may come a time when we're no longer interested in God. We need to seek him while we can. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Teenager, the vast majority of people who make commitments to Christ do so before they're 18 years old. So don't be thinking, I can deal with this later. Don't count on that. About the time the face clears up, the mind begins to go. The writer to the Hebrews says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you're thinking, I'll deal with God later, 
I'll get the best of both worlds. I'll live it up now with no restrictions. Then just before I die, I'll give my life to Christ. Don't count on it. Your heart could become hard and you'll have no interest in God. The third reason we should come to, before winter to God, there should be an urgency in responding to God is because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. If a person says like Jesus did, I'm going to be crucified on a cross and three days later I'm going to be raised from the dead and then he pulls it off, we had better sit up and listen. Here's the account of Jesus' resurrection. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Jesus was put in a tomb. They found the stone rolled away, and when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, they didn't think, oh yeah, Jesus said he was going to be raised from the dead. That's why he's not here. Resurrection was the furthest thing from their minds. Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. These would be angels. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Only when the angels told them did they remember that Jesus said he was going to be raised from the dead? When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven. The eleven would be the eleven disciples and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Let's put the narrative on pause. If you believe that Jesus was a great teacher, but the whole idea of Jesus being raised from the dead, you say, that's going way too far. Well, you're in good company. The disciples thought the resurrection was nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Peter saw the linen strips that had wrapped Jesus' body lying there, kind of like folded up. If Jesus had been stolen, they would have gone out with him. But they were there, kind of like Jesus evaporated out of them, like you would expect with a person with a resurrection body that has, you know, kind of is human still, but has powers like to walk through walls. That's when Peter began to realize he really was raised. The resurrection proved that Jesus was the Son of God. Fourth reason we should come before winter to God is because there is life after death. We can tend to get busy with our school, our jobs, our families, our friends. And we get lulled into thinking that this life is all there is. We spend all our time thinking about this life and never thinking about what happens after our life is over. A few weeks ago, I took Jory on a trip to Kona. We had a wonderful time. We picked where we were going to go, where we were going to stay, and what airline we would fly there like a year earlier. You've done the same things, planned a special trip way in advance. How strange to put time and energy into a trip that lasts only a week, yet not take time to learn about our final destination, which will last for eternity. The Apostle Paul writes, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Set your hope fully most of us don't even think about it partially. Heaven may be coming. Great. But it's a long way off, and who really knows? For most people, heaven is 
something we're hoping will take care of us someday in the future. But at the present, we don't give it much thought. We'd be wise to take a look at what happens to us after we die. The Bible teaches that after we die, we will experience great joy or terrible regret. Jesus tells a story. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. sores. Jesus is a master storyteller. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. That would be heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. See what a great storyteller Jesus is? Because I'm in agony in this fire. Notice that after we die, we'll be fully conscious. We'll be fully aware where we are. And we'll have the sense to realize that what has happened to us is just and fair. Neither the rich man nor Lazarus felt they were dealt, dealt with unfairly. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot. Nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Moses and the prophets refers to the Old Testament. So he's like saying, they have the Bible. Read that. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. What a parable for our times. Many of us are unconcerned about our final destiny. The Bible teaches that after we die, we will go to one of two destinations, heaven or hell. Most pastors seldom talk about them, so we don't think of them as something real. What will heaven be like? Well, most people think of heaven as a place swarming with angels, singing 5,369 verses of some old, dull hymn. Like, boy, that sounds so boring. Heaven will not be boring. It'll be an amazing place. Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. On sunny days in the Northwest, we feel like we live in heaven. Think what it'll be like when all creation receives its full glory. There'll be no more death or crying. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. No funeral services. No tombstones. No tearful goodbyes. The second destination is hell. A couple planned to take a vacation to Florida the husband had some business down there, so he went a few days early, and the wife was to come and join him. So when he got down there, rather than a customary phone call, he decided to email her. As he was typing in her email address, he got one letter wrong, and by mistake, he sent it to a woman whose husband had just died that day before. The grieving family heard their mother scream as she read this email and they dashed into the study. They found her passed out on the floor and they read this email. My eternal sweetheart, I've checked in and I'm feeling wonderful. It's, re it's really great here. I have a terrific room and can't wait for you to join me. Your eternal love. 
P.S. It sure is hot down here. <laughs> so if hell is a place for eternal punishment after death, how come it's talked about so lightly? I think it's because hell has come on hard times. Hell, more than any other teaching in the Bible, seems to be out of step with our times. One man said he would not want to be in heaven with a God who sends people to hell. To put it simply, the punishment doesn't seem to fit the crime. Yes, some people do evil, and some people do a lot of evil, but nothing anyone has ever done can justify eternal torment. It's like capital punishment for a traffic violation. On the other hand, we can't just throw out the doctrine because it doesn't seem to fit our days. Jesus spoke about hell more than anybody else in the Bible. What is often to overlook is that hell is a comforting doctrine. Hell means that one day there will be justice. We all know that in this life, things that happen are not always fair. There are terrorist attacks, bombings like in Sri Lanka. There are crimes of murder, rape, and child abuse that are never solved. From the beginning of time, humankind has believed in a final judgment where all wrongs unpunished in this world will be righted and all good deeds unnoticed will be recognized. Heaven and hell assure us that justice will be carried out. Hell also shows us that God loves us so much that he's prepared a place for those who don't want to be with him. We get it wrong when we think that hell is the place where all the fun people will be. Hell will not be fun. Everybody in hell will be alone. It'll be miserable because it's the place where God will not be and God's the source of all good. It would have been immoral for God not to prepare a place for those who don't want to be with him. God has prepared a place for those who say, you know what, God, no thanks. I don't really care to be with you. Hell is the Bible's breathtaking doctrine that God will take no for an answer. So let's be done with the notion that only a terrible God would create a place like hell. Hell is the doctrine that God respects us so much. He's prepared for a place for those who don't want to be with him. Furthermore, Christ loves us so much that he bore our hell so we wouldn't have to bear it. When people ask, what kind of a God would send people to hell? It's a caricature of God. The God of the Bible does not send anyone to hell. Over hell's gate is a man on a cross, Jesus Christ, who died to prevent people from going there. To get into hell, one must ignore that man, must squeeze past him. God has done everything in his power to keep us out of hell. It's absurd in the extreme to say, I don't want to be in heaven with a God who would send people to hell. Why would you not want to be with a God who loves you so much? We need to come before winter in our relationships with people and our relationship with God. In a moment, I want to give you an opportunity to talk to God. Maybe if you'd like to tell God you'd like to come before winter to him. I believe God brought every one of you here today to hear him say to you, I love you so much, I sent my son to give his life to die for your sins. And three days later, I raised him from the dead, showing, demonstrating that he's the son of God. If you believe Jesus is the son of God and God raised him from the dead and confess your sins to him and invite him into your life, you can begin a relationship with God today. I urge you to come before winter to the God 
who loves you. Let's pray together. I want to lead you all in a prayer right now. If you feel like you'd come before winter to God, you can just do so by praying with me as I lead you. If you feel like you've given your life to Christ in the past, it would be no harm in you just kind of mouthing these words after me as well, kind of recommitting your life to Christ. So you just pray silently to God. Dear God, I haven't always known for sure, but I'm pretty confident that you exist. And God, I know I've done some things wrong. There are things that just aren't right in my life, and I want you to forgive me. There's a lot of things I don't understand, but I do believe that Jesus is your son. And the evidence is pretty good that you raised him from the dead, showing that he's the son of God, and I believe that. And I want to invite you today to come into my life. Be part of me. I want to ask you to make me a better person. And I commit myself to you, to following you, doing whatever that means. Probably reading the Bible. Talking to you in prayer. Coming to church. Because I want to have you in my life. Thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen.